Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What's going on, everybody? What's up, family? How you doing, Miss Paulette? Hey, Miss Cynthia, what's going on? Desiree. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Like this is this is a great time right now. Hallelujah. For those of you who are jumping on, let's go ahead and like. Let's go ahead and comment. Let's share. Let's go ahead and tag a few people because Holy Spirit got something that he wants to say because this is his Bible study. Hallelujah. I just want to give you all a few minutes to go ahead and let's get the word out. Let everybody know Bible study is on right now. Hallelujah. And in the midst of that, I just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to Household of Faith Ministries, everything Bible study, right? Because we get the word out. Hallelujah. However, Holy Spirit leads us to get the word out, whether it be on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Look, it's the everything word, right? Hallelujah. So look, whatever we need to do to get this word out, because somebody's waiting on y'all to tag and, and to tag them. Somebody's waiting on y'all to share this word right now. Cause somebody needs to hear what, what's, what's getting ready to be said, right? Hallelujah. So let's go ahead and sow that seed. Right. Because sharing this live right now is sowing the seed. And y'all know one of the principles of the kingdom is you can expect a harvest. We don't do it for the harvest. We do it because we have an opportunity to build kingdom. We have an opportunity to get God's word out. Look, y'all, it's not my word. Right. It's not it's not my word. It's not our word. It's God's word. And all we're doing is we're putting our part. We're doing our part. Hallelujah. We're playing our position. We're in our position. We're operating from our seat. Glory to God. What's going on, Tice? Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and get this word out. Man, I'm excited, y'all. I hope y'all are too. Look, this is going to be the fuel that we need to get us through the rest of the week. Hallelujah. So I'm hoping that y'all bringing y'all expectation. I see you, Miss Cynthia, already expecting. Yes, let's bring our bring our expectation. Hallelujah. Pull on the anointing of Holy Spirit. Because I'm pretty sure we all need to hear a word, right? So we're not pulling on the words of Pastor Fred, uh, Pastor Billy, Pastor Donna, Pastor Danielle, any of any of the pastors, right? We're pulling on the words of Holy Spirit, the word of God. And we're asking him to say what it is that we need to hear that's going to catapult us into our next. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, babe, I see you. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Let's get the word out. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to go ahead and get this word song started because I'm ready to go, y'all. Let's go. I'm so excited right now. If you haven't had a chance to do so, please make sure you like, please make sure you comment, please make sure that you share, right? We are not stingy with the word of God. Hallelujah. Because everybody, all of us, everybody needs to hear a life changing word. We are not stingy with the word of God. If somebody comes to mind right now, Holy Spirit is showing you them for a reason. Go ahead and tag them. It don't matter what the relationship look like, right? Go ahead and tag them. Because it's not us that changes the people. It's the word of God that changes the people. So let's go ahead and just do our part. Let's go ahead and do our part. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. First and foremost, I want to just thank God for another opportunity to be able to come before y'all and, 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 and minister the word of God. And I want to thank the under shepherds of this house, pastors William and Donna Porter, for even uh, being obedient to the Holy Spirit and just putting us in a position to be able to do so. And I know my wife, Pastor Danielle, got me covered right now. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, because this is going to be an awesome, awesome, awesome lesson. 
right? Hallelujah. So before we even get started, we just want to give God praise. We want to give God praise and then we're going to jump into prayer. So just jump in with me. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Lord. You're such a good God. Simply marvelous, God. Hallelujah. You're the Lord of Lords. You're the King of Kings, Father God. We thank you, Father God. So marvelous you are, Father God. Such a great Father, Father God, for loving us even when we don't know what love looks like, Father God. I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. So great. So great. So worthy, God. You're so worthy, God. You're worthy of all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Father God, right now, we just thank you for yet another privilege to come before your people, Father God, for another privilege to be able to come before you and hear what it is that you want to say. Lord, I thank you that as I decrease right now, Father God, that you increase. Father God, let only your words be heard. And let only your words be spoken in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God, that as we sit on the edge of our spirits, Father God, to receive what it is that you want to say, that even right now we are increasing our expectation and we are posturing ourselves, Father God, to catch what it is that you want to release. Lord, what a privilege it is to just be able to sit under your anointing, Father God, to be able to sit under your words, your teaching, your instructions, Father God, that will take us into the assignment that you have called us into, Father God, the purpose that you have called us into, that even in the times that we see, Father God, that we can lean on you and not to our own understanding, Father God, for you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of all the glory. You are worthy of the honor and worthy of the praise, Father God, that as we take authority over any distraction that may try to hinder us from hearing your word, Father God, we cast it right now in the, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God. May your word come across with accuracy and boldness and be unhindered by any outside forces. We serve the devil and his posse. Notice right now you have no place, no power, no authority in the word of God. And nothing shall stop your people from hearing what it is that you want to release in the mighty name of Jesus. And it is your son, Jesus Christ, mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Once again, welcome to Household of Faith Bible Study, y'all. Look, I'm I'm fired up and I'm ready to go. Hallelujah. Because Holy Spirit has something that he wants to say. So all we got to do is just catch the revelation, right? All we have to do is just position ourselves. And we are studying out of, I'll pull it up for y'all real quick. Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes by Rick Renner. And we are studying out of the Companion Study Guide. If you did not get this book yet, you still got time. So let's go ahead and get that book. But what I want to pay attention to right now is right on the cover says, one of the questions on the minds of Christians today is, when is Jesus coming back? It is the same question that has been asked by believers for more than 2,000 years, including the disciples. Hallelujah. It says, including the disciples. So just know it's not just you. I know you hear all the chatter that goes on in the world, right? Oh, it's the coming, it's the coming. Look. This, this 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 text right here is going to break it all down for us. Hallelujah. But just know it wasn't just you. Even the disciples had questions. So we're going, we're jumping into lesson three. We're going to jump into lesson three. Hallelujah. And the topic is called worldwide deception. Hallelujah. Worldwide deception. And I want everybody to just uh, confess right now. I am expecting. I am expecting. Let's go ahead and put that in the chat. I am expecting. Glory to God. I am expecting. Yeah, I see you, Miss Cynthia. I am expecting. Because I know I am. Look, I got enough expectation for everybody. So <laughs> I am expecting. Glory to God. So we always want to start off with our synopsis. Right? So there you go. Glory to God. Glory to God. I see everybody's expecting. Yes. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. We are increasing our expectation right now. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It is a privilege to increase our expectation. So our synopsis reads, located in the ancient city of Eropolis is a place called the Bulletarian. The word Bulletarian comes from the Greek word bull, which means to counsel. Hence, the Bulletarian was literally the place of the counselors. History reveals that during the first century, virtually every ancient Greek and Roman city had a Bulletarian, where the city counselors met regularly to discuss all the issues of the city. 
They talked about taxes, laws, marriage issues, alcohol addiction, and problems plaguing society. Make no mistake, the first century was a very dark time filled with many challenges, and the city councils were always looking for answers to the problems people were facing. Yet, it was nothing to be compared with what will take place in society at the end of age. I'm going to go ahead and tell y'all right now, it's going to be a lot to unpack in this lesson here. It's going to be a lot to unpack in this lesson here. So look, we're going to grab on <laughs> and we're going to we're going to take off. Hallelujah. We're going to grab on of what Holy Spirit is saying and we're going to take off. In 1 Timothy 4.1, the Apostle Paul said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul gives this emphatic warning that in the last of the last days, a sizable cross-section of people in the church are going to withdraw from their long-held faith in God, and it will be the result of increased demonic activity running rampant in the world. There was just a lot right here. First and foremost, Paul did all of this under the inspiration of Holy Spirit. So when I seen that, I said, okay, so you don't, you don't move on your own. We're not supposed to move on our own, right? The only reason why Paul was even able to give an, a warning or anything was under the inspiration of Holy Spirit. So that was not by Paul's power, not by his might, but it was by inspiration of Holy Spirit. So even in that, when it says that the Spirit speak expressly, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. If we just pay attention to what's going on in the world right now, this 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 is so relevant to the times that we are in right now. Hallelujah. And it's due to the result of increased demonic activity running rampant in the world. Thankfully, we don't have to become a statistic in this fallen way. Glory to God. Look, everybody, I am not a statistic. Hallelujah. I am not a statistic. Let's confess that right now. I am not a statistic. Glory to God. I am not a statistic. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, I'm thankful. Thankfully, we don't have to become. But it's a choice. We don't have to. That, that is a choice. So I don't have to be a statistic. Hallelujah. And we confess that we are not a statistic. Glory to God. We have the Holy Spirit as our God, teaching us how to live victoriously in the midst of difficult times. Look, I don't know about y'all, but I was able to grab hold of that right there, right? Because we have Holy Spirit as our God, he's teaching us how to live victoriously in the midst of, right? in the midst of, meaning that does not mean things are not going to happen. That does not mean that the world is not going to try to present itself to you or try to knock you down or whatever. Nobody said it was going to be easy, right? But because we have Holy Spirit as our guide, teaching us how to live victoriously, right? That's consistent, victoriously. It's ongoing in the midst of the difficult times. So no matter what it looks like, because we have Holy Spirit as our God, you started at the point of victory and you're going to end at the point of victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I am victorious. I am victorious. Glory to God. Grab hold. Grab hold. Look, anything that's being released right now, all you have to do is just grab hold of it and it's yours. Anything released in this atmosphere, you can grab hold of it. Put your name in it. The emphasis of this lesson the first sign that Jesus gave indicating that we are nearing the end of the age is worldwide deception. This widespread departure from the truth will also infiltrate the church, causing a number of believers to gradually withdraw and fall away from faith in Jesus Christ. He's telling us the signs, y'all. A review of our anchor verse in Matthew 24, Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple area in Jerusalem traveling east. In verse 3, the Bible says, and as he, referring to Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? There are five important words in this verse that we really need to understand. So anytime I'm reading the word of God, right, I try to put myself in it. So 
I picture Jesus sitting by himself, right? And you know, the disciples were close. So instead of trying to talk to Jesus in the crowd, they tried to like, hey, yo, Jesus, look, yo, uh, listen. So can you tell us? Because we've been running with you this whole time. So, you know, as close as we've been, I'm pretty sure you could you, you could share a little bit of information, right? They tried to pull him to the side and ask him, hey, when, when is this going to be? So they can be ready, so they can be prepared. So when it says there were five important words in this verse that we really need to understand. The first word is the word when. The disciples asked, when shall these things be? The word when is the Greek word pot, and it describes specific information and pictures one seeking a concrete answer. The disciples asked very specific, concrete information regarding when the things that Jesus had said would take place. Again, they on the side of Jesus. Come on, man. I know you could tell me. I know. I, look, I, I know you could because I know you know. But can you just tell us? We won't tell nobody. Right. The second word is the what. The disciples asked, what shall be the sign of thy coming? In Greek, the word what is the word T, which describes a minute, minuscule detail. The use of this word lets us know that the disciples were saying, Lord, don't be vague. Tell us exactly and explicitly down to the tiniest detail what the sign of your coming will be. They're like, don't sugarcoat it. Tell me exactly when and, and, and where. T tell me. I need to know. The third important word is the word sign. In Greek, sign is the word simian, and it describes a marker or sign to alert a traveler to where he is on the road. Signs are authenticating marks or specific signs, letting one know how much further he has to go to reach his destination. If we don't have signs, then we just roam aimlessly, not knowing where we are. The use of this word is the equivalent of the disciples saying, Lord, please reveal to us the authenticating markers we will see on the road to the end of the world. What are the signs that will alert us to how much more we have to go before you return? And the fourth word to take note of is end. The word end is the Greek word centilius. And it describes the closure, summation, or wrap up of something. The inclusion of this word lets us know that disciples had an inner knowing that eventually everything would run its course and come to an end. When the present age ends, it will give birth to a new age, which the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. The fifth important word is the word world. It is the Greek word anos which does not describe the world, the earth, or the universe. The word anos describes an age. Every age has a concrete beginning and a concrete end. And the disciples were asking Jesus to tell them explicitly and exactly what the authenticating sign of his coming would be and when they had reached the end of the age. Man, this, this was so good to me because every time you're hearing the, the chatter in the world talking about, you know, the end of the world and, 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 and all of this stuff, right? But based off the word of God, world wasn't even referring to this physical place, right? It's not describing the world, the earth, or even the universe. It's describing an age. And when I hear age, I'm thinking about an era, right? And there were so many different eras that has taken place on, uh, on earth already. So, when we're hearing about the coming of Jesus, it's not the destruction of a physical world. He's saying the end of an age. These are the things that we need to be paying attention to. Worldwide deception is the first sign that Jesus gave. What was Jesus's response to the, the disciples question? The Bible says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. The first sign we can expect to see before Jesus comes and this present age wraps up is worldwide deception. The phrase take heed is a form of the Greek word blepo, which in this verse means watch or pay attention. It is spoken in such a strong tense, it was intended to jar and jolt the listeners. It is as if Jesus was saying, stand up, throw your shoulders back, 
open your ears, watch, listen, be attentive, and really pay attention. So when I picture that, it's like somebody getting up and they putting their ears back and they're looking and they're being attentive and they're, they're trying to hear what's, what's, what's going on. Like, look alive, right? Look alive. You need to be paying attention to what's going on around you. You have to watch and pay attention. He's not saying to be slouched. You can't, you can't be observant and, and, and you slouching, right? He's saying, no, I need you to perk up. I need you to look around, pay attention to the signs that's going on. Once Jesus had acquired the disciples' full attention, he unveiled the first and foremost sign that will mark the end of the age, saying, Take heed that no man deceive you. The word deceive here is a translation of the Greek word planao, which depicts a deceptive, moral wandering. It pictures a people who have veered from a solid path. Now, what stuck out to me in this text was it said once Jesus had acquired the disciples full attention. So when you're just reading scripture, right? A lot of times if if you're not if you're not diving into it, then you sometimes you may miss something, right? Or the timeline in which something is said. So to me what stuck out was he said take heed and he didn't say another word after that. Yet, right? But once he acquired the disciples full attention, that's when he unveiled that first and foremost the signs. And that's when he began talking, but he didn't say another word until he had their full attention. So you can't come to God asking God a question and then you half listen. That's where a lot of us miss it at, because when it comes to the things that God is trying to say to you, right, God requires your full attention because he, he don't want to have to repeat himself. So he wants to make sure the instructions that he's releasing to you you are giving him your full and undivided attention because anything other than that, you still operating in disobedience, right? Because it's a privilege to be able to hear God. It's a privilege for you basically, you're on the inside, right? You're on the inside. You have an opportunity to be in the holy of holies because of who you carry on the inside of you. So God don't want to have to waste his time trying to give you an instruction that you have listening to anyway, because all you're going to do is come back and say, God, what you say? God, I'm sorry. Can you say that say that for me one more time. God going to be looking at you like, what? Bro, do you know how many people are waiting to hear from me? Do you know how many people are waiting to hear from me? And you're going to half listen. I'm good. Let me let me let me go holler at such and such over here real quick. Right. Hallelujah. So now the word deceive used in Matthew 24 and four can also mean to wander off course. It can depict an individual who has wandered off course or even describes a whole nation or even vast numbers of nations that have veered off course from a moral position they once held to be true. Before I even go forward, y'all, let's let's confess, God, you have my undivided attention. Somebody needs to confess this right now. God, you have my undivided attention. I don't know who it's for. It could be me. God, you have my undivided attention. You have my undivided attention because we get so busy moving around that you miss the voice, right? You, you miss God. We move around so much. The world tries to keep you moving so much that you miss God. This confirmed for us. God is requiring our full attention. That is the least that we can do. Especially in the times that we in, he's trying to say something, but if we keep moving around, we're going to miss it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It suggests a moral wandering on a worldwide scale at the close of the age. In Greek, this word deceive depicts the behavior of someone who once walked on a solid path, but who was now drifting and teetering on the edge of a treacherous route. This person has either already departed from his once solid path and has lost his bearings as a result or he is in the process of departing from it. This word deceive means he is going cross grain against all that was once part of his core belief system. And sadly, he is now deviating from his former solid moral position to a course that is unreliable, unpredictable, and even dangerous. But why would these things be unreliable, unpredictable, and even dangerous? When I think about this, it's because so many doctrines out there now are based off of people's opinions, right? 
which is not solid scripture. It's not based on the word of God, right? It's 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 all based off of people's opinions. And I also think of a uh, uh, one of the the Bible study books that we did um, not too long ago, and it was the Apostles' Creed. So when it says that he was deviating from his former solid moral position to a course, I said, man, you're moving away from your core belief system. So for anybody on here, if you don't know what the core belief system of Christianity is, we recommend the Apostles' Creed by Rick Renner as well. That gives you a solid foundation on what it means to be a Christian, what it means to believe in the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This word deceives tells us emphatically that there will be a mass divergence from time tested biblical standards at the very end of the age. By using the word planao, translated as deceive in Matthew 24 and 4, Jesus was foretelling that a moment was coming when society would move away from the long affirmed laws of scripture. Although he specified many signs to indicate the conclusion of the age, he declared this mass divergence from truth, a worldwide moral wandering, would be the first, foremost, and primary sign to alert us that the end was near. Just look around outside, right? Look around on social media, look around on the news. You see all the indicators. You see all the signs that we're speaking of. He was foretelling a moment that society would move away from the long affirmed laws of scripture. When you think about it, there's a reason why things get put in place. There's a reason why God leaves instructions. There's a reason why God left all the breadcrumbs. He left a blueprint, right? Because he knew already that there was going to come a time where there's going to be so much going on. And everybody's moving to and fro with the wind, with everything that we see. But he says, no, biblical standards have been time tested. They've been here since the beginning. Long affirmed laws of scripture. If you're doing anything outside of scripture, right, then you're outside of that. You're outside of the word of God. You're outside of the will of God. That's the thing. These things have been time tested. Although he specified many signs to indicate the conclusion of the age, he declared this mass divergence from truth, a worldwide moral wondering, would be the first, foremost, and primary sign to alert us that the end is near. The words of Matthew 24 and 4 are intended to let us know that those who live at the very end of the age will see moral confusion in society as deception attempts to engulf humanity with misinformation about what is morally right and wrong. We see this everywhere. It is simply a fact that we are watching this moral confusion rage across the world as never before in our lifetime. Now we look at the news and we see that confusion is everywhere. It don't matter what channel you turn on. It don't matter what social media platform you get on. It don't matter where you go in the world. Right. We see that there is nothing but confusion happening. The confusion is perhaps no clearer anywhere, anywhere than the debate over gender identity, a manifestation of confusion so severe that it stuns most thinking people. The culture most of us knew when we were growing up was Judeo-Christian. But now as the winds of change are blowing, we're watching as the world is rapidly departing from time-tested beliefs and traditions that are based on biblical values. And as a result of this near abandonment of truth, and throwing away of moral foundation, confusion abounds in society that is teetering on a treacher treacherous path. All of this meaning is packed in the word deceive in Matthew 24 and 4. Now, <sighs> Holy Spirit has been highlighting the conditions of the world now. So when hearing just even the whole gender identity thing, and, and, and all of this confusion, right? It was, you see, it's no longer even teetering on a treacherous path. So if you're looking for a timeline, right, you're in it. Because it's, it's no longer teetering on a treacherous path with everything being just legalized and er everything happening, right? Confusion is everywhere. School systems. 
television just out there. It's running rampant in the world. So we just got to we got to pay attention. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul addressed the crisis of worldwide deception in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3 by issuing this warning. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Let us not be deceived. Don't be deceived by what you see. Don't be deceived by what you see. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Don't be deceived by what you see. Hallelujah. First of all, when Paul talks about that day, he's referring to the return of Christ. Thus, he says that the rapture of the church will not take place until there is a falling away first. In Greek, the word first is proton, and it means first in order, in first place, or to begin with. The Greek word for falling away is a translation of the word apostasia, which is where we get the word apostasy. It is a compound of the word apo, which means away, and the word stasia, which means to step. When these words are compounded to form apostasia, it describes a falling away or revolt. It is even the word for mutiny. Immediately on the hills of the great apostasy and Jesus coming back to gather the church to himself, the Bible says, that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. The Greek word for sin here means lawlessness. So the man of lawlessness will suddenly be unveiled once the church is taken out the way. That is the assignment of the enemy. That, that, that is the agenda, right? So Holy Spirit has already given us the, 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 the signs leading to this. So you can see what's happening in the world. The man of lawlessness will suddenly be unveiled once the church is taken away, not before, once the church is taken away. But listen to this. The world will never embrace the man of lawlessness until the world becomes lawless itself. Now that, that speaks volumes. When you look at what's happening in the world, what's being pushed, what's being pushed in the media, everywhere. And then you, you have all of these conversations and, and, and about everything, everyone being desensitized and things like that. So much so that things that weren't normal all of a sudden become the new normal that you live in because it no longer bothers you. That's how sin works. Sin creeps in and gets you so comfortable in what you're doing that you're so comfortable doing it. And it becomes a normal lifestyle to you. It's no different than the world introducing this man of lawlessness, right? So now you see with everything that's being, the world running rampant and everything, it's all for that, the entrance. It's all for the unveiling. Now, these are things that are based on scripture. So I, either way it go, it's going to happen. Or what we, our job is to be prepared. Our job is to be ready. Our job is to be ready for war, right? Because the world obviously is going to continue doing what the world is doing because no matter what, that man of lawlessness is going to be revealed. But where do you stand? That is the question. Lawless means without God's principles or departing from God's standards. That is the definition. Without God's principles. So you don't live for God. And you departed from God's standards completely. You're doing your own thing. That is lawless. In that dense, dark season of time, people will throw themselves open to every conceivable new idea and totally depart from the time-tested, solid path of Scripture. They will teeter on the edge of something very dangerous morally and will become so open-minded they will receive the man of lawlessness whom the Bible calls the Antichrist. The man of lawlessness is the Antichrist. So this is why God says I'm requiring your full attention, right? Because there are things happening right now in the spirit that you may not be able to see naturally, but you can feel it. You can sense it. 
Holy Spirit is telling you. That's why he's our guide, because he's guiding you into the times that we're in and highlighting these things and letting you know, hey, look, this is where we at right now. Hey, pay attention. Pay attention. This is where we at right now. So we don't teeter on the edge. As believers, we, we, we can't be lukewarm. Lukewarm is teetering on the edge and trying to pay attention and focus on every other doctrine. God will send unbelievers strong delusion. Paul went on to say in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. In Greek, the phrase, and for this cause is kai dai toto, which means for this reason or because of this. It pictures God's response to the world that is rejected him. To those who want nothing to do with God, he's going to give them exactly what they want. I can hear my pastor. I can hear Pastor Billy right now. He always says, he always says, you know, not only does God change, God doesn't change his plan. He just changes his man. But he also says that Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. And this is exactly why he is, because God is, right? To those who want nothing to do with God, he'll oblige you. And he's going to give you exactly what you want. He loves you that much that he's going to give you exactly what you want, because you won't give him his, your full attention. That's not God's. That's not God's problem. That's not God's issue. If God is speaking to you, then you have his full attention, right? Out of the billions of people in the world, God is using his breath to speak to you. And then if you choose not to receive it, he's going to allow you to do so because his plan is going to be accomplished no matter what. I would much rather be a part of the plan and the will of God than to be in the world. Specifically, the Bible says God will accommodate those unbelievers by sending them strong delusion. In Greek, strong delusion is energy in. Energy in planes. The word energy in is from the word energio. And it depicts a force propelling something forward or an energy that ignites a process and facilitates it all the way to its conclusion. So God is not going to have do anything. If this is what you want to do, he's going to help you go all the way. So when he sends that strong delusion, that is going to be your, your, your propel, your, your, your propelling force that you feel. If you want to indulge in it, he'll give you the push. The word plain pictures wandering or deviant behavior. It is a form of the Greek word planeo, which is translated as deceive. In Matthew 24 and 4, it means to leave a solid moral path and has even been used to depict an animal that lost its way and could never find its way back home. The passage forecasts that at the end of the age, many in society at large will embrace lies. They will turn their ears away from the truth and begin listening to philosophies and theories that are not based in scripture. God will accommodate their desires by allowing them to become energized by deception. That is what strong delusion means in Greek. It is a picture of society veering so far off track that it will not be able to find its way back home to the truth. Yo, this, this, this was so good because it's, it's so easy to jump into so many different things, right? So then a lot of times you can feel that, that, that so energized by deception. You find one thing, you look for another, you look for another, you look for another, you look for another, right? And God doesn't say don't seek him or seek the things of a God because we, we know that there are hidden mysteries in the word of God. There's a difference. There's a huge difference. If God is saying seek him for the hidden mysteries versus going everywhere else to find the hidden mysteries, then that's the difference, right? Because you can easily be deceived by something you may see or find, but this is the strong delusion that it's referring to. One of the most disturbing aspects about this widespread departure from the truth is that it will also take place in the church. Returning to Jesus' conversation with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, he said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. This is Matthew 24 and 5. Notice the words in my name. In Greek, this literally means on the reputation or strength of my name. It is a picture of people coming in the disguise of Jesus's reputation. And they will be saying, I am Christ. 
The word saying here is a form of the Greek word legantes, which means alleging, claiming, or perpeting. And the word Christ is Christos in Greek, which is the word for the anointing. Hence, a better translation of this part of the verse would be, people will come disguised in my reputation claiming to be anointed. This this was so good to me because you see so many, whether it be ministers, pastors, what have you, everywhere. And so many people, um, they come in Jesus' name, right? They got a platform. You see them ministering from a pulpit or going out trying to minister to people and everything like that. But this topic is about deception. It's about deception. So when Jesus is warning us, saying that people will come disguised in my name, he's saying they're coming disguised in my reputation. People throwing on, throwing on a suit or a dress, get up on a platform, get to speaking. They could say Jesus, right? They, they, they could say everything. But the intent behind everything that they're saying is to deceive you. So those will be the ones who get up there and start saying, yeah, I do this for God and da 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 right? And be the same ones who also show the ungodly from the pulpit. These are the ones who put such a bad taste in, 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 in the world's mouth, or I hate to say baby believers, but those who are new to, to, to the faith, right? Uh, new to knowing Christ. They put such a bad taste in people's mouth that no longer do they want to even participate in the things of the church. That's why so many people out here now who don't think that they need to go to a church or to uh, 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 an assembly of your brothers and sisters where iron sharpens iron, right? They, they don't think they need to go to these places. They believe that the, the, the church is in them, which it is, but they believe that they can stay in the confines of their homes and still receive from Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying that you can't, but there's something about that corporate anointing, right? But because so many people have been deceived and so many people have been hurt by churches and, and false teaching that they no longer want to step in there. So now they're missing out on that corporate anointing that God had for them. Not saying that these people can't be saved, right? But if we have an assignment and a purpose in our lives, we are to be equipped and trained within these corporate settings under that corporate anointing. We have to be under leadership in order to receive those instructions too. But because of the deception that has been done in these disguises and these masks that people wear, the, claiming to be anointed. It doesn't say that they are anointed. It says claiming to be anointed. Anybody can look at the word of God. The devil knows scripture. Anybody can look at the word of God and try to put a sermon together. That's why you have to be led by Holy Spirit on where it is that he plants you in your local church. Jesus said these pretenders will deceive many. The word deceive is again the Greek word planeo, which depicts delusion or a moral wandering. Specifically, it is a moral wandering from the foundational doctrines of the Bible, resulting in confusion about what is right or wrong. This is the delusion that will be at work in society at the end of age. Come on. Everywhere we look right now, it wants you to be okay with what the world is doing. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. That, that We serve a God that is, that is that's above all of this. That's how we can step everywhere and still be blessed. That's why as, as, as us being redeemed believers, these are things that we don't have to fall for. With us as believers having Holy Spirit as our God, these are things that we don't even have to fall for. These are the things that are at work in society. I don't have to look at something and figure out, is this right or is this wrong? All I have to say is, is this scripture? That, that's what I have to say. Is this based off the word of God? If I can't find it anywhere in the word of God, then obviously it's not right. God already told us how we should live. He already told us what we need to be seeing, what we need to be saying. The only thing we need to be speaking is the word of God. Anything else that this world tries to make you okay with, you don't have to be okay with it. You don't have to be okay with it. Hallelujah. We don't have to be okay with it. So it don't matter what the, I don't have to conform to the world. I'm continuously transformed. <laughs> That's what I am. I am continuously transformed because it's, it's a process, right? It's a process that we do continually because every day this world tries to affect you, but every day you are transformed. 
in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul confirms that deception will infiltrate the church in 1 Timothy 4 and 1. Writing under the unction of the Holy Spirit, he said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The word expressly in this verse is the Greek word retos, and it means explicitly. It describes something in undeniable, unmistakable terms. It is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit raising his voice and speaking emphatically, categorically, and explicitly in the clearest of terms. You cannot mistake what Holy Spirit is saying to you. Timothy 4 and 1 confirms that. If you need a scripture reference, we cannot mistake what Holy Spirit is saying to us. The issue comes in when we allow ourselves to be opened up to hearing other voices. But he speaketh expressly, undeniable, unmistakable terms, in the clearest of terms. There is no mistaking when God is talking, but you allow yourself. So either hear yourself, you allow reason to come in and rob you of what Holy Spirit had to say. That's that's the thing. But that's why our leaders teach us, right, that when Holy Spirit speaks, you just move on it. You train yourself to do so. That comes with experience. You train yourself to move on what Holy Spirit is saying because you heard him right the first time. So don't allow yourself to procrastinate, sit and wait and try to process what he said, because in that process, right, you can be infiltrated. That word can be infiltrated. So you want to make sure you just move accordingly. Hallelujah. What did the Holy Spirit say so strongly through Paul? He declared that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. In Greek, the word latter is hysterion, hysteron, which means at the very end, at the final conclusion. And the word times is a form of the Greek word kairos, which describes a season of time. Thus, when we come to the very end of the age, the devil will be at work in the church, causing some to depart from the faith. From the clear, sound teaching of scripture. The phrase shall depart is a translation of the Greek word episteme, which means to change positions. What is interesting about this word is that it does not mean a rejection or an abandonment of the faith. It is a slow methodical departure, a gradual stepping away or withdrawal from the faith to embrace something new and different. This departure is the result of believers giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Hearing that, this, this, is, this is what helped me. It didn't mean you rejected the faith. It didn't mean you abandoned the faith. It's a slow process. Methodical departure, meaning there, there's a method to everything. In order to ensure your departure, though, right? The end result is departure. But you're thinking like, oh, it's just going to be a, a hard stop. Or a, as we say, cold turkey. No, it's gradual. It's gradual. It's a slow, methodical departure, a gradual stepping away or withdrawal, right? It's a stepping away or a withdrawal from the faith to embrace something new and different. But that is what giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils look like. Isn't it amazing that before Jesus ever talked about wars and rumors of wars, kingdoms rising against kingdoms, or earthquakes and famines and pestilence, the first authenticating sign he gave that the end of the age is near is that deception will run rampant, even in the church. That is why the first thing he said to his disciples and us, because he's not just talking to his disciples, he's talking to us, is take heed that no man deceive you, when worldwide deception is taking place, you will know that you've come to the very, very end of the age. And Christ 
is on the verge of coming back. In our next lesson, we'll take a look at the next signs Jesus gave us that mark the end of the age, wars, commotions, and nations, and kingdoms against nations and kingdoms. We looking for a timeline, y'all? We're in it. When we look at the world, there is worldwide deception everywhere. What was good to me was he said the last of the last days in the beginning of this lesson, right? We always hear, oh, yeah, no, we in the last days. People are like, yeah, but it was supposed to happen yesterday. It was supposed to happen 2012, whatever, right? There's no time. There's no natural timeline in the spirit. He said the last of the last days. These are the signs that we would see. Worldwide deception is the that's the first sign. We are in it. If it was ever a time for us to pay attention, it is now. If it was ever a time for us to seek God, it is now. If it's ever a time for us to know God, it is now. Worldwide deception is taking place. That means that we are at the very, very end of the age. And Christ is on the verge of coming back. Y'all, this... This lesson was so good to me. I hope y'all got something out of it. I see you, Masu. Take heed that no man deceive you. If there's any takeaway, take heed. But when you when you hear take heed, make sure you, you, you're being attentive now, right? Perk up. Put your shoulders back. Lean out your ear. Keep your eyes open. As we say, keep your head on a swivel. Right, because you always need to be aware of your surroundings. That's either in the natural or even in the spiritual. How do you do that? You build your relationship with God. You build your relationship with Holy Spirit. I'm not taking a tour nowhere with a God that I don't know. I got to have some type of conversation with you. I got to know your name. I got to know where we going. I I I have to know something. I have to know something. That's how you do Holy Spirit. You speak the Holy Spirit. You build that relationship with Holy Spirit. The more you build this relationship, the more he can guide you to be victorious in these difficult times. That's how we take heed. He, as uh, soon as something happens, somebody say something, he say, red flag, red flag. Take heed, take heed. And he'll let you know, all right, this is what you need to do. Hey, you need to stay away from there. You need to go away from here. Stop talking to this person, that person, everything. But in order for you, to even be able to access anything that we just spoke on, that Holy Spirit just taught us tonight, you have to know who he is. So I want to offer salvation to anybody on here who does not know Christ as your Lord and Savior. And all we have to do is very simple. We go based off the scriptures, Romans 10 and 9, and you just believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess from your mouth that God raised him from the dead on the third day. And then you just repeat after me, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart and be Lord of my life. And it's, it's that simple. It is that simple. Now you have access to this victorious God that we've been speaking of who is Holy Spirit. He wants nothing but the best for you. All you have to do is just take that step and accept him. And if you said that prayer and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, put something in the comments. Let us know that you did. Look, you're not in this by yourself. There's a whole family, a whole kingdom family here. And we say, welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the kingdom family, right? And get a part of a great, simply marvelous Bible teaching ministry, such as Household of Faith, such as household of faith that can teach the word in a way that you can hear it, understand it, and apply it to your life. That, that that's that's all we ask because it's about kingdom. It's about getting the word of God to you and to the nations and to everybody who needs them because we all need them, especially in the times that we're in. So we're thankful for anyone who has decided, yes, this is what I wanted to do. And you could join us every Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. for our Bible studies. Because look, we're, we're never out of word, but we want to be respectful of your time. And I encourage you, if you don't have this book, if you don't have it, I'm going to put it back up for y'all. If you don't have it, if you don't have it, please get it. Please get this book. This right here is a great one to add to your arsenal. Because the word of God is an arsenal in this world. Because we're we in a foreign land right now, right? 
So what better way than you needing to be equipped with the proper tools to navigate in this foreign land? Signs you'll see just before Jesus comes by Rick Renner. And I'm pretty sure uh, the link has been posted in the in the chat, <clears throat> excuse me, in the comments for you to be able to get this book, right? Hallelujah. And then I also want to make sure um, that we extend the opportunity to sow. Right now, I got up to four ways to give. You can make an online contribution by visiting hofmnc.org, or you can text to give. That's 919-267-2260, or you can mail it in P.O. Box 40278, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27629. Or you can cash app, dollar sign H-O-F-M-N-C. Again, that is cash app, dollar sign H-O-F-M-N-C. Hallelujah. And look, if you're in the local Raleigh area, right, you can come visit us at 3527 Maitland Drive, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27610. Or if you're not in the local Raleigh area, but you still want to say, you still like what's going on in Household of Faith. I like what God is doing at Household of Faith. We have phenomenal under shepherds, pastors William and Donna Porter, right, who lead us and teach us and train us, hallelujah, by the leading of Holy Spirit, because it's Holy Spirit's ministry. It's his vision, but they're just great stewards of the vision that he has given them. So we say you can still become an eye partner. An eye partner is just an internet partner right? It's just, you're not in a local area, but you like what we're doing over here. You want to be a part of what God is doing in the house. Then there is still a way for you to be able to connect. You can just go to hofmnc.org. Um, you can click the I'm new or you want to be a partner. Hallelujah. And it'll be right there for you. And guess what? We are here because household of faith is not a building. It's a family. So wherever you are, we just want to say, we love you. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. It's still not too late to share this word. Hallelujah. Because it's God's word. It's not ours. We don't own the word. It's God's word. So sow your seed and expect your harvest. Hallelujah. And I just want to say thank you all for the opportunity. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege to be able to minister to your people. I know I received and I believe in my heart that they have received also. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. So I want to say thank you all. And have a great night. Look, make sure you get this book. Make sure you get it because you can always go back and you can read it for yourself because Holy Spirit may say something different to you. So make sure you tune in, lean your ear in. He said, perk up, right? Take heed. Don't forget, let's not be deceived by what's going on in the world. 